question this morning. I want, you to, I want you to say it out loud, okay? This is not like something to get you to buy something either. I want you to think of a place you've always wanted to visit. A country, a city, a place. Don't say Walmart. I want you to think about a place you've always wanted to go, always wanted to see, always wanted to walk the streets of, Okay? I'm going to count to three when I say four. I'm only counting to three and four is the trigger. When I say four, you yell out as loud as you can. You don't have to scream. Just yell out what that place is, okay? So think about it. Get it set. Some place you've always wanted to go, some place you've always wanted to visit, some place you've always wanted to see. One, two, three, four. Okay, I don't know what you said. But I'm sure they were great places. Okay? What did you guys say? Florida. Florida? Okay. What about on this side? Somebody, Sylvia, where did you want to go? Alaska. Alaska. Okay. To heaven. he- heaven's a great place, too. <laughs> if you want to go to Alaska, I just want to know when do you want to go? What time? Like now or February? Somebody back there in the back, where did you want to go? Italy. Italy? Israel? Israel. Nobody said Indiana. I mean, I, I, I mean no, no, you know, nobody said Louisville or, you know, look, look, we all, we all go to different places. We've all been in different places in our lives. But I want to bring up a verse that we're all familiar with, and not just because we have a missionary this morning, okay? I want you to understand that in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go therefore and make. I want you to think, what, you've done, what have you done this week? What have you made this past week? What did you personally make? Not what did you do, what did you make? Did you make an impression on somebody's life? Did you offer encouragement to make somebody smile? Did you, did you tell a funny joke? Did you give somebody some encouragement to, to make a difference in somebody's life? You see, all of us are supposed to go and make, and specifically in this passage, it's about making disciples. It's about being a witness. It's about being an example. It's about sharing who Jesus is by living it out in in a practical manner in front of the crowd or the individual or your boss or other people you work around or maybe the classroom. But we're supposed to go and make. And you know that go and make, he didn't say, but only do that on Sundays, did he? He said, go and make make and the aspect of the greek is that while you're going and while you're making disciples do all these other things you're supposed to be doing we are supposed to go and make so i want you to ask yourself the question what did i make this week i'm not talking about a paycheck i'm not about making money i'm talking about what did you make who did you invest in who did you encourage who did you witness to who did you make a difference whose life is better because you were a part of it this week you know if you can't go to the mission field if you can't we can't you can't we can send people we can hear the heart that somebody has for a certain country but i believe everybody here probably has a leaning towards some places in the in the world when i pray for missions and this is just me because of the places i travel to when i pray for mission when god puts a, a burden on my heart to pray for missions i pray for eastern europe that's just always been where I, I feel led. Poland, Moldova, Russia, Ukraine, that area. Long before Russia invaded Ukraine, I've been praying for Ukraine for several years. Just have a, a burden to pray for that part of the world, that part of Eastern Europe. Those Eastern Bloc nations. I find myself still praying for missionaries and friends I know in Germany and in Poland. And yeah, I pray for other countries. I pray for Ecuador a lot because I've been there a few times. But I have found that God wants us to pray 
for our missionaries. And that's why those, the, 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 the pictures are out there, the missionaries that we support each month. That's why that, the map's out there, the, the, so you can look at that and think about the parts. Of the world. I want to encourage you, as we go through this year, to pray for the other nations. I encourage you to pray for the lost in those. I, I encourage you to pray for the leaders of those nations. I hope that some of you this week found some time to pray for Vladimir Putin. I wonder if during World War II there were Christians who were praying for Hitler to get saved. I wonder when all the craziness was going on in Cambodia if anybody was praying for Pol Pot. I think God calls us to pray for the leaders of nations. Because as the leaders go, the nations go, right? So missions is more than just sending missionaries. Missions is having a heart that says, okay, Lord, there's lost people everywhere. Anybody here got lost neighbors? Guess what? That's your mission field. Anybody here got friends and family that are lost and don't know who Jesus is or aren't living their life that they should for him? Guess what? That's your mission field. God calls us, calls us all to serve him. There's a certain group of people that he hand selects to go and travel the nations of the world and, and to go and to give their hearts to those people and to make a difference. And you already know that, that for this year, we're going to really emphasize the loss. We're going to emphasize reaching the loss as much as we can. Why? Because Jesus said to. It is go and make. Go and make disciples. Go and invest. Go and put your heart into it. So that's why I'm asking the question, what did you make this week? What did you personally do to make a difference in somebody's life? What did you do this week to make a, to make a difference in, in the hearts and lives of people? I've had a lot of questions, uh, several text messages, emails came in. Have we heard from Larry? Well, just this morning, uh, I was on the phone out here in the foyer with, with uh, Johnny and Linda. We, we called Larry. He's not been answering his phone. He's still in Louisville. They're getting ready tomorrow to send him to the Somerset area to do some, to do some, uh, some therapy. And it, he's still two to three weeks out from them knowing exactly what they're going to be doing, if, he can, if he'll be able to care for Stevie anymore. We do know for a fact he did have a heart attack. Uh, he had a serious infection in a leg. Uh, he, he, he basically had the heart attack and was face down on the ground for two days before they found out where he was. He'd been doing, he had done some travel over the holidays, and so no one was thinking about, is everything okay? And they found, his brother kept trying to get a hold of him, never, never could, never could, never could. And so they got in there, took care of him. He was in Monticello Hospital, Lebanon Hospital, and he's been in, in, in Louisville since last Saturday, so over a week. He'll be doing rehab and therapy. So be praying for Larry because whatever's happened with Larry is going to be a life-changing moment. And we've got to, we've got to realize that our, moment, our lives can change just like that. In a flash, you know. In a flash, life can change. And so we don't know the difference that we're supposed to make in people's lives, but we've got to take advantage of every opportunity that we have. And I want to tell you just a real quick story. I was a youth and children's pastor back in Jasonville, you know, for the, for the 10 years that I was there, my home church, home community. And we used to pick up, we would take vans out and pick kids up every Sunday and every Wednesday night. And we'd pick up a lot of kids. And there was a, there was a, trailer, a trailer house that we used to pick these kids up at. And, and they were some rough kids. And... Uh, a guy like Levi probably would have visited that trailer several times a week to give you the ideas of what was going on. And we were picking up these kids every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, coming to church and investing and, and pouring into these kids and loving them as much as we could and trying to share the gospel and trying to be an example. And then one, one evening, I don't know if we were married yet or not, I can't remember if, if we were, I'm watching the news, and I see this trailer, and I see him hauling two parents out with handcuffs. I never saw those kids again. And it was like, oh my goodness. I'll never have a chance to talk to those kids, share the gospel, pray for them, pray with them. 
and the oldest little girl, it was part three or four kids that came from, from that house, and they would always sit together and just almost like clutch each other at church. And we used to, I mean, we loved on those kids and we prayed for those kids, but we never could identify exactly what the issue was. The parents were busted, the kids ended up in foster care, and I never, ever got a chance again to see those kids. And you know what? From time to time, I will think about, I can still close my eyes and I can see their faces. And many, many times I said, okay, Lord, did I do enough? Did we encourage those kids enough? Did we love them enough? Did we, did we teach them enough? Well, you know, what, what, what could, more could we have done? Well, I never had another chance to do anything. So that's why I say, take advantage of every breathing possible moment that you and I have to share the gospel, to encourage somebody, to tell somebody you appreciate them, to say thank you, to say I love you, to say I forgive you, for, you know, or to, to ask for forgiveness, whatever. Take the time you need to take to say what you need to say and do what you need to do because we're not guaranteed tomorrow, are we? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So that's why we've got to go and make disciples today. That's why we've got to be intentional today about the things that we say and the things that we do. So would you stand to your feet? Worship team, go ahead and come to the platform this morning. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord to just help you be sensitive to being intentional. I want you to approach this coming week being intentional. Because you may not have that opportunity to say those words that you need to say. You may be able to share the gospel another time with those people, those family members, those friends, those husbands, those wives, those kids. Take the time that you have to say what you need to say. And take the time that you have to do what God's called you to do. Be intentional and go and make a difference this week. Go and, and pour yourself into the lives of people. All right, so pray with me. Lord Jesus, as, as we approach this service this morning, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We're thankful for the salvation you provided through your blood being shed on the cross. But God, help us to be sensitive this week, to listen, to watch, so that we can speak to others. God, we will be around people that are lost this week. We'll be around people that are confused and frustrated and angry and disappointed this week. We'll be around people who are empty, totally, thoroughly empty, God, because they don't know who you are, and I pray that we can intentionally be a witness to them. They can see, feel, hear, and experience the love and the, of, of Jesus and the presence of God in our lives. Lord, help us to literally go and make disciples. Help us to be intentional and give us wisdom. Give us the words to say. Give us the opportunities to be the example that we need to be to a lost and watching world. Lord, help us and remind us that there is a mission field laid out in front of every single one of us in this room. And there are people that we need to influence and make a difference in. And because of what you've done in us, we can in turn share that with others. So Jesus, be glorified. Be lifted up. Be exalted in this service this morning. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. And may our hearts be turned towards you. And may we leave this service with a greater heart for missions, a greater heart for the lost, a greater heart for our neighbors and our family and our friends that don't know who you are. God, that's our solemn prayer this morning. Help us to go and make something this week. Help us to go and invest in people. Help us to go and make disciples. Help us to be a witness and to be an example to those that desperately need to see Jesus in this lost and dying world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. let's worship him in spirit and truth today, folks. Nothing ever messes up till Sunday morning, right?
keep it hold out. I love your voice You have 
led me through the fire in the darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so.
Got it. 
desperate for God to move. You needed him to move. You needed him to work on your behalf. Last night, my phone rang at the house and I answered with Sharon Pace. And she was, she was emotional. She was crying. And she said, Pastor Dane, I'm, I'm having so much trouble with my eyes. I'm not going to be able to even drive to church during the day anymore. She's struggling. She's struggling. So we want to pray for Sharon Pace today. Linda and Johnny and I talked with Larry, Larry Shaw, this morning. And he just sounded very, very weak. He's had a heart attack, you know, a week ago, laid there for two days. Needs, a, needs, a, needs the hand of God at work. We didn't talk at all about Stevie. But you and I all know that Stevie is the first thing on his mind right now. Stevie's basically all that, Larry's all that Stevie's known for, you know, many years, 10 years. So I'm sure the weight of, am I going to be able to take care of Stevie, is heavy on Larry's heart. I don't know what you carried in here today, but you know that we believe, I believe, this church believes that God still heals, that God still moves. If you need a touch in your body, I want to challenge you just to come. Come on up, we'll pray for you. We're going to believe that God still does what his word says he does. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, guess what? He still raises the dead. He still casts out demons. He still heals the weathered hand. And the folks that have never walked for 40 years can leap again for the first time in their lives. So you need healing. I want you to come. You need wisdom. You need direction. If you're desperate, if you are literally desperate for God to do something, in your life today. You need him to move in an unparalleled fashion. We're going to pray for Flo today. Doug's just wearing her out, folks. We appreciate you so much, Flo, and your love for the Lord, your ministry. Folks, standing right here right now is one of our Assemblies of God ordained ministers. Thank you for answering that call when so many people, even in this area, stand against women preachers. Thanks for taking hold of that call and running with it, Flo. God's honored your work. God's honored your ministry in this community. Thank you for what you and Doug have both done to invest in this church. Because there's blood, sweat, and tears here. Thank you for that. So we're praying for strength. We want... Uh, Someone can grab me a microphone. Thank you, Levi. You know, I'm always saying we want to share testimonies. So we're going to do that today. Michelle told me yesterday at our prayer time, thanks for those that came yesterday to pray with us. But she shared it. She told me, she said, I want to tell you what God did for me this week. And it wasn't, it wasn't a small thing. So share with us, Michelle, what God did. Um, I started hurting. Just talk real close. I started hurting in my uh, side, left, right abdomen. And I, uh, I thought it was like gas or, you know, something. But anyway, I went to the doctor. Um, she didn't know pretty much. Um, had trouble getting the insurance to order a CT. Went on for about three days, and after we finally, she sent me to the emergency room. Well, I had ruptured an artery in my stomach on that side, and it was in, instead of being on the inside of my cavity, it was in my abdominal wall. Well, you'll know an artery is one of them, is not a vessel, it's a, it's a big thing. If that had been in my cavity, and, or if it had not caught it off itself, had God not caught it at all, I would have bled to death and died. So God fixed it. It was all contained. I, didn't, I, I don't have to have it drained. I didn't have to do anything. God had it fixed before I ever went to the doctor. And I want you all to know he heals. That's not the first time. 
and I know it won't be the last. So he's not just the great physician. He's the great surgeon. He's the great fixer of all things. So thank you for sharing that with us. No doubt we've had a miracle that God did in her body. And it, it, you walked in here today, didn't you, Michelle? Are you in any pain right now? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Because he's the pain taker. Amen. He's the pain taker, folks. He's faithful. So let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done in Michelle's body. Lord, you took care of it. We know what a doctor has told her. She could have bled to death, but did not. Why? Because you showed up. You had your hand on her before anything else was known. Or so you took care of that situation. So we give you glory for the miracle, Lord. And we're thankful you're going to continue to do miracles in this place, in our midst. We lift up Sharon Pace to you right now, Lord. You would touch and heal her eyes. You would bring comfort and peace to her life, Lord. We pray for Larry. You would just wrap your arms around him. Lord, I know he's, he's, he's worried. He's weary. He's tired. Lord, there's still concerns about his kidneys and concerns about his heart. And, and they want to do that diet test, but they're concerned. Lord, I pray you take care of those things you take care of. And Lord, I know weighing heavy on his heart is he going to be able to take care of Stevie again. Lord, they've been together for many years. He's been caring for him for many years. And Lord, he's worried. He's weary, God, because that's been his whole heart, his whole life. So bring peace to that situation. And be with Stevie, God. Because all Stevie's known for 10 years has been Larry. So help Stevie work through those things that are going on there. And keep him peace in his heart. And Lord, we let that flow to you today. I want to thank you for the call of God upon her life and for her answer to that call. Lord, you know the, the weariness and the weakness that she's had recently. We pray for strength. We pray for physical ability to come, God. Everyone else at this, at this altar today, Lord, at this cross, we pray for strength, for healing, for miracles. Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good. We declare with our own lips right now, you are the God who brings blessing. You are the God who brings hope. You're the God who heals, who hears and who heals, who can do above all, who can do all things above what we even think about doing, Lord. You do those things. So bring the strengthening touch right now. Lord, touch Misty Dyer. Bring healing there. Bring hope there. Strengthen and encourage Raymond and Thelma, all they face, all they're going through. Lord, touch Hugh's body. Strengthen him, Lord. Encourage him. You know everything that we have brought to this cross, and we leave it here, Lord, in your hands <laughs> to do with as you will. Thank you for being faithful to your people. Thank you for being faithful to your church. Thank you for being faithful to each individual family in this body. But we also lift up John, John Brown to you this morning, who's home dealing with food poisoning and trying to recover that, Lord. These folks just moved here from Oregon, become a part of our church and be a part of our community. Lord, pray for healing and blessing there today. Strengthen them, encourage them. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness to your people, to your people. Be glorified in us. Oh, we are desperate for you to move. We're desperate for you to work in our lives in powerful ways. And as you heal, as you work, as you move, may we testify of all that you've done every day to as many as we can, Lord. Help us to go and make a difference this week where we live, where we work, where we are. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. The faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God.
there's that passage that I've referred to from time to time that Paul spoke when he said, even if we are faithless, God remains faithful. He will always be the solid, stable foundation in our lives. He's the God who hears you, who knows where you are, who knows what you're facing, who knows what's coming. Five seconds from now, 50 days from now, 20 years from now, he already knows. He already knows. So thank you folks for being faithful to pray and to trust the Lord when it comes to healing. Ushers, if you come at this time, we're going to take up this morning's tithes and offerings. We will be taking up a second offering at the end of the service for our missionary uh, who is headed to Scotland. We were talking last night about some, I've been to some of the places that she has been and will be going and excited to see what God is doing in, in Western Europe as a whole too. So keep that in mind. And, and gentlemen, go ahead and just begin to go throughout the congregation. Uh, folks, we had a little bit of a situation this morning with Pro Presenter, as you saw, and we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna publicly declare who to blame, all right? And we're going to do that in a fun way. Uh, on Wednesday nights, Micah uses the same software and the computer in the youth room that we use on Sunday mornings here. And to do that, you have to deactivate from that computer to go to that computer. And jo uh, Jolene found out very quickly this morning that Micah had forgotten to unactivate his laptop. And he, is, he and Hem of the Day are on the PK retreat. That stands for Pastor's Kids. Doug, Mr. Lewis, let me give you this. Oh, well, this is for later. I'm sorry. I guess I don't need you, Doug. I'm sorry. Chase you around. I'm going to respect my elder and be more cautious next time. But nonetheless, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, you, hey, Doug, Hugh just said don't confuse you. So I'm sorry for confusing you. Because um, he is old. Is he older than you, Hugh? He, he's a lot older than you, isn't he? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Hugh, you just stay as young as you are and keep, we'll keep Mr. Lewis on his toes. But anyway, uh, Mike it. Mike is on the PK retreat. That's pastor's kids retreat. And what they do is they take pastor's kids from all over the state and they take them on a trip and they, they invest in them and they, they, they pour into their lives. And um, they especially like having PKs like Micah, who's a pastor's kid, uh, be the mentors for some of these young people. So they're mostly higher elementary up to high school age, and they just take them on a trip, and they're investing in the pastor's kids. And my kids did that, and, and I, I appreciate the time. But the laptop that he uses on Sunday mornings is in the hotel wherever they are. So raise your right hand and repeat after me. All of this, the, 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 all of this is on Pastor Micah this morning. Uh, I'm saying that because um, we, we have the license, okay? But I had to go in a back door of the software to get it to be able to go up. The, and you notice it kept saying Pro Presenter. Pro presenter. I did not do anything illegal, I don't think. But if there's federal agents that came in the door, guys out there in the foyer, don't let them in, okay? But I appreciate all the work that our, that our people in the sound booth do uh, from the live stream to the words uh, to the announcements. Appreciate all that very, very much because it takes a lot of work um, to do all that. And uh, we'll just let you can let Mike know he was blamed. Uh, this week by his father so uh, nonetheless so the pastor's kid is the one that made the mistake this week so oh well all right hey real quick some announcements coming up uh, welcoming women is going to be starting a new bible study in march called trustworthy but in february february 4th they're all going to meet here and then head out to the bread of life in liberty so, ladies, if you have any questions about that, the, 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 the welcoming women activity that Saturday, February the 4th, they will be going to Liberty, Kentucky, to eat at the, at the Bread of Life uh, restaurant. So keep that in mind. Also, at the end of February, we're going to have a business meeting. And I want to encourage as many of you as possible to stick around for the afterwards. The church will, will provide the fried chicken, the drinks, and, and the tableware. We just need you to bring some desserts and some, some side items and some, just some good stuff to eat. Uh, we're not going to drag it out all afternoon, but there's some very important uh, issues, uh, things that we want to talk to you about, some concerns that were brought up from last year that we want to address and get out there on the table. And most of you know if we have issues or concerns, I will address them publicly. So we're going to do some of that with some of the things that happened this last year. But we're also going to be electing, I almost said arresting, 
We're going to be arresting four board members that Sunday. No, we're going to be electing, and Levi will be involved. Uh, we're going to be electing four board members. Um, Garen can serve again, and each board member serves for three years. You can be elected for two terms, and then you have to set off for a year. So out there in the foyer table, there's these real small strips of paper. Each member can nominate four potential board members. And that, elect, and that Sunday, February the 28th, I believe it is, we will be electing four board members, uh, giving you a financial report of the previous year, letting you know what's going on with our mortgage and other things. Yes, Doug. A lot of times we can say that people are eligible, but a lot of times people will not, will not serve. So it's okay for you to nominate somebody. They may not like you if you nominate them for board, but nonetheless, they still have to love you. But what, what happens is each nominee, we look at, first of all, if they're not a member and they can't serve, that name gets set to the side. I will go to each person that's nominated and I will say to them, are you willing to serve on the board? We check to make sure that they're tithers because that's part of the board requirements and also part of the uh, general council bylaws of the constitution, constitution bylaws of the Sons of God. We want people in leadership who are giving towards the church in that sense. And then I will also talk to them about baptism of the Holy Spirit, making sure they agree with our doctrines and sound things like that. And then they will say yay or nay. And then we will no nominate those four. We will tell you who the nominees are for that particular Sunday. And even if we only have four nominees, we still required by law, Robert's Rules of Order, to have a legal election. So we wanna do things on the, on the right. And, and so uh, each member, if you're a member of the church, you're allowed to nominate four board members or four nominees, four names, four potentials, four, so nominate four men towards that position. And uh, those nominees, nominations will, are gonna be finished on the Sunday, the 29th. That'll be the last Sunday that you can nominate. So you've got three more Sundays or today and two more Sundays to nominate those four men. And then the second Sunday of February, we will announce who those men are and you'll have two weeks to pray about it. And then on Sunday, February 28th, you will, will have the vote, the meal, and also talk about the financial, uh, the financial uh, situation of the church, what we've done with the building and things like that so that you know where we are as a church. And any questions you might have about things that happened this previous year, I've had several, several people ask me about some specific things that we're going to address so you'll know what those are. And I just want to encourage as many of you as possible, even if you're not a member, you are welcome to stick around and hear what's going on. Okay, we don't, we, we're not, we don't think there's going to be any fights involved. Um, we'll have seating for tall people and, and seating for shorter people, you know. We'll put the tall people in the back of the meeting so they can see over the rest of us. So, but you're in the second row, so that's, that's fine, Sylvia, for day. Not a whole lot. Joyce, can you see over her head? Just, just want to make sure. Okay, just want to make sure. So we'll have, we'll have fun no matter what happens that day. And we need a lot of you to bring as many really, 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 really good desserts as you can. Because you can't have, look, Pentecostals cannot meet without eating, right? And Pentecostals cannot meet without good desserts as a part of that meeting. So that's going on. Uh, also, uh, towards the end of this month, uh, we're going to have a blood drive on January 27th. It will go from noon to 6 uh, if you're willing to give blood, please sign up through the Kentucky Blood Center. Uh, there's a number you can call, a website you can go to. And then that night, we're going to be showing the movie, Show Me the Father. So I kind of joked last week and said, you know, sometimes you have dinner and a movie. This, week, this, this month, we've got blood drive in the movie. So nonetheless, come and be a part of that if you can. That movie will start at 7 o'clock on Friday night, January the 27th. Once again, it's called Show Me the Father. All right. How many know that we care about missions in this church. No, no, let me say, how many know your pastor cares about missions in this church? How many knows that your pastor wants you to care about missions in this church? Um, just a couple weeks ago, matter of fact, I got, I got a text message from a, from a missionary that, that, that I was, we worked with in Egypt several years ago. And he said, I hope you've had a great Sunday service. And then he, 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 he stopped and he came back and he said, I hope you will have a great Sunday service because he's 11 hours ahead. And he said, I got my, he says, I'm still in Egypt time, even though he's in Kentucky. We have missionaries out there that we support on a monthly basis that are grateful and thankful for what we send to them. 
And because we send that money per month along with other assemblies of God churches, those missionaries can make a difference where they are in the world. So God plants them, God calls, God sends, and they go. Once again, we go back to Matthew 28. All of us are supposed to go and make. All of us have a different role in what that go and make looks like. And God's called some as pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers and leaders. But you know what? All of us are to go where God tells us to go. And so I'm grateful that this church supports missions like it does and, and, and did this last year like we've done. But I want us to do even more this year. Why? Because it's biblical. Go, send, support, do whatever we can to make sure we reach the world. I keep having a dream, and in that dream, I keep seeing the headlines. Eight billion people, eight billion people, eight billion people. I just keep being reminded of how many lost people there are out there in our world right here, right now. And it's not always Scotland or Africa or the other nations. It's your neighbors, it's your friends, it's your family. And we've got a mission. You and I are here on this planet with a purpose. And that purpose is to exemplify who Christ is so the watching world can see the difference he's made in you and in I. Now, we have a purpose in the body of Christ. And that purpose is to get the gospel out at whatever cost. And there are some that the cost is that they go. They leave the confines of this country they leave the, the, the comforts and the luxuries of this country and go elsewhere because God has called. And Jennifer and I spent some time last night with, with Crystal Alexander, who is here today, on her way to Scotland. And she's got some photos out there, and, and we, we talked about haggis. And we, anybody know what haggis is? Anybody here ever had haggis? We'll talk about it sometime. It's an acquired taste. I, I do know that. If I tell you I don't like something, it's because I've tried it. I grew up in a home where we were allowed to try everything you can imagine food-wise. And I've been to enough countries that I've tried enough stuff. And so if I tell you I don't like it, I've tried it. And I'd rather, I'd rather have that approach. If, I, you know, if you say, I don't like it, have you tried it? You say, no, I'm going to say, try it then, right? That's the approach you should take in one, when it comes to food. Just food is what I'm talking about. But I want you to make sure that when we have missionaries, spend time at the table, pick up that prayer card, and pray for that person on the field. Even if it may not be in a nation or a place where you're typically usually, you usually pray for. I've got, I've got missionary friends that were Bible college friends of mine. They're serving all over the world. And it's, it's, it's neat to know that I remember them. I know, I, I, you know, I was in the same classes with these people. Realize that missionaries are people just like you and just like me who God's called to go and do something for him somewhere. And so I always appreciate hearing the stories and the background. And I also want you to understand something about that we need to understand in missions. And you're probably seeing this too. Used to be in the assemblies of God, the only people who were called to be missionaries were pastors. And guess what God's doing now? God's calling people from the pews from the business world, from the tech world, from the education world, and saying, I want to use you. And he's sending these folks. And not just younger folks, older folks. Why? Because there's a mission and there's a purpose. So we, got, we want to be intentional about missions in our church and do what we can for missions and missionaries in our church. So remember, there'll be another offering at the end of this service. And I want to ask you to help us to do even more for missions this, this year, 2020, than we did in 2022. It's not about a number, folks. It's about our hearts. It's about realizing that we've got limited. Anybody here believe that Jesus is coming back soon? You know what? If we believe that, then that means we've got to do something while we can now to get the gospel out. And the other thing that I really, really, really appreciate about our missionary today is she's a miniature schnauzer owner. And Bridget right now is in a little box in my office. And after, after lunch today, Moose and Maple get to make some missionary puppy friends. That really does excite me. It really does. Because I think it's cool. But Crystal Alexander, come and share with us what the Lord's done in your life and in your heart. Thank you for coming and being with us today. And share your heart with us, okay? Let's give her a warm welcome, folks. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, Bridget's a sweetheart. Moose and maple are adorable. And I love the little white one. Lynn? Is that? What is it? Bella. Oh. Um, my stepmom, Barb, uh, she's very artistic. And uh, over Christmas, we were talking about my Bridget because she's almost one years old now. And, and she was, she's a painter. She's very creative and she likes to create stories. And she goes, she's like a little superhero. She's believer pup. BP and she was like creating these scenarios and she wanted she was wanting to make a kid's storybook about with God all things are possible so yeah sorry <laughs> haggis okay so every place has its regional favorite like I've had fried chicken growing up y'all make it different here and it's really good I mean fried chicken out in Kansas is kind of like the okay like whatever but when I came to one of my first church services in Kentucky and they said they're having fried chicken afterwards, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then I tasted it. Oh, okay. So the national dish of Scotland is haggis. Those who can't handle gross things, please put your fingers in your ears and hum. Okay? So it's the guts of a sheep and oatmeal and spices boiled in a sheep's stomach for hours. And then they serve it, well, they serve it any time, but on um, Burns Night, you can look that up and understand that by Googling that, but Burns Night, they serve it with haggis, neeps, and tatties. So it's mashed potatoes and mashed neeps, which that's either swede or turnips or rutabagas or something. Anyway, it's yellow and it's mashed. And the way they do it is they have that big stomach thing that's filled with all the food. Now, once again, put your fingers in your ears and hum. Oh, and the cute ginger dog too. Sorry squirrel and they take a big knife or their sword and they go and it kind of goes Bleh. and that's because the scots are Rawr. they're great they're great so um every place has their thing i'm not wild about haggis but while i was in britain i did get to taste black pudding though i had no intention of doing that you ever get yourself in those situations you know, the, it was a bed and breakfast. The lady comes out with the big British breakfast with the beans and the tomatoes and the bacon and the ham and the sausages and all the stuff. And there was black pudding and she was so happy. And she just set it before me and smiled really happy. She wasn't trying to be sneaky. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, help. And so, and I, and I took a bite. It's amazing. You need black pudding in your life. When you have a really good steak, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm all better now. It's like that. Black pudding. It's blood sausage. It's, it's brilliant. Well, I am going to be uh, preaching from Isaiah 26. Please grab your Bibles. We're going to be digging in deep. And right in the middle of it all, I'm going to be telling you about this mission to Scotland. But this is uh, a preaching of the word and the sharing of the mission both. So we are going to be going to Isaiah 26. And we're going to be starting with verse 16. And I really hope you have your imagination cap on today. That's what we used to call it back when I was a kid in the 70s. Be ready to see with your imagination, with your holy anointed imagination, the imagery that God has here in scripture. Because it's gonna kind of be like one of those great big European murals that cover the whole side of a whole wall. And there's so many little images involved and we're gonna try to, as best as I can by the Holy Spirit, share what images are there and then we'll let the Holy Spirit do his thing and speak to us. So Lord God, I pray that you would string me up like your bow, notch your arrows, your messages into me. Holy Spirit, you pull back and you let fly according to your will for your glory. Lord God, I surrender to you. May your words be said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, this is going to be about hope and about the lack of and the difference, okay? So starting Isaiah 26, the first image is going to be verses 16 through 18. And some of these are going to be tough, okay? All right. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pains, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O oh Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Yowzer. Okay. 
What's going on here? You notice at the beginning of the chapter, this is written to God's people. It's written to Judah. These are the people of God. These are the ones who were given by God the way to have relationship with them. But just like any other human being on the planet, we've all of us gone our own way. So th- Judah and Israel, they'd been utzing in a little bit of this pagan worship from that nation and a little bit of this Baal and a little bit of this priestesses, wink, wink, and they had been mixing it up for so long that they were numb to it. Does that sound familiar? They were numb to it, and it comes to a point where God's just like, oh, whatever. Oh, the sun and the stars, let's worship. Oh, Molech, let's burn the babies and all this stuff. So here they are in verse 16. Yeah, they're in trouble. No, duh. They had been so sinful. Now they're in a heap of mess. And so here they are, like all of us humans. Oh, Lord, help, right? Help. But they, they felt like, and this is the imagery, and this is not to hurt any lady in the house. This is a spiritual condition. They had been so full of themselves and their own ideas, it felt like they were pregnant with the solution to the problem. Oh, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. Oh, it hurts. Yes, but the solution is inside of us. We can bring salvation to the world. We can save the earth. We have the answer within us. And you know how the Lord describes that in the word? Wind. The solution to their problems, to all their sin, to the world falling apart like it is, is not in us. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, by his spirit. So that's where they're getting really messed up here in verses 17 there, um, and then in, in 18. It's a false pregnancy. And I think our world is always at that stage where we think we have the solution and then it's a false pregnancy. And um, what's interesting at the bottom of verse 18, uh, this is Crystal's paraphrase, okay? We can't save anybody. We can't even kill the bad guys. We think as humans, we're so powerful that we can annihilate the world or we can save the world. You know what? Only God has the power to do that. And we live under his authority, whether we like it or not. We can rebel, but that's not going to get us too far. So this is a very, of the, uh, there are six images. This is the first one. This is a very tough image, but it's an honest one. And when we go to the, when we go to the doctor's office, if we have a very serious disease, we don't want him or her to tell us just take an aspirin. We need to know what's really wrong. And he's, and he's given it. And he's given it. Okay, so... That's the the dark side. Now, the next verse, verse 18, my second image here, is the answer to that, the godly answer to that. Verse 8, verse, excuse me, 19. Verse 19. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, uh, fresh basil, fresh cilantro. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Here's hope, and it's in a very powerful word. That word is resurrection. When Jesus Christ came, and I love that you guys have a cross, multiple crosses. You know that's kind of phasing. I go to a lot of churches. That's not always present. When Jesus Christ truly died, not fainted, died on the cross for our sins, he took it all upon himself, but that's not where the story ends, as we know He, by the power of God, was resurrected from the grave. Yeah, and that is where we have the hope. Because together with his dead body, we are risen from... I love when we do water baptisms. And my dad's a pastor, and he always explains it very well. It's just simply how beautiful the symbol is. I am crucified with Christ. I went down into the grave. And then we are new creation in Christ Jesus. We are, that is the power of the symbol of water baptism. It's so a public declaration of what he's done in your life. And so we are resurrected with Christ when we 
come humbly, and shall I use the R word, repent. I'm wrong. I am so sorry. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I've been in rebellion. And he does. I mean, this is one way he resurrects us because now we are brand new. He, he comes inside and does what only God can do. And we are new in Christ. And then it's, he just doesn't leave it there. There's more resurrection to be done with healing, with delivering from crazy things in our lives. But also, my mama has been in the grave about nine years now. But there is coming a day when the Lord will give the shout. There's that shout. And then there's the trumpet sound. And then the dead in Christ will rise. I don't know how. It's a miracle of God. Here's my best. You know? Great. Yahoo. Because God cares about all of who you are. And he is, he is redeeming the whole package. And he's going to do it in his own way and in his own time. But what hope? He cares that deeply for you. This is the hope. This is, the, this is what we cling to. We can't save ourselves. This is the salvation. I love it that it's like fresh dew. The best, Satan always got his uh, mock copy. The best the devil can do is like a zombie. Okay? That's the best he got at resurrection. But Jesus does. Fresh like cilantro. I cannot get enough cilantro. Fresh like basil. I can't get enough of basil either. But it's just, and the earth can't hold it back. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down, right? Ain't no grave. So the earth can't hold you back. When you belong to Christ, when you're surrendered, when you are born again, then you are going to be fully resurrected. So yeah, 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 Jesus. Okay, now third image, verses 20 and 21. Now we're going to get tough again, okay? Strap in, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 26. Come, my people, into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. Okay, what's going on here? Because we're talking about the imagery is come in, uh, chambre is the French chamber. Come in, come in and stay there because the indignation, the, shall I use the W word? The wrath of God is coming. All right. Remember the people of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt for what? Like 400 something years. And uh, God sent Moses to go to the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and he told them to let my people go, right? You guys know this, right? And so um, Moses, needing some help from his brother, but Moses, he goes to the king. And so God starts displaying his power in front of all the Egyptians, in front of the king, and in front of his people. And so you know the 10 plagues, right? Help me out. I mean, like the first one was the water to blood, right? Help me out. Frogs, speak louder. Lice, ooh, yeah. Boils, ooh, yeah, dark. Can you imagine, have you ever been in a cave where you can't see your, it's so dark, yeah? And what else? Oh, those hailstones, imagine, yeah. So he does all these 10 plagues, and then he, the 10th one is really interesting. So he tells the people, okay, Israelites, you, you need to take your families, each of you, and you need to slaughter a lamb. You put the blood on the top and on either side of the door. You get your family, you get your kids, all of them, and you get granny, grandpa, the whole thing. You get in there and you stay there, the Lord says, because I am going to pass over the land. Now, and he is going to kill the firstborn of each family. Guys, I think in recent years, we're getting a really twisted sense of what wrath is. Because I'm not you, of course, just me. I got a short temper. Sure, I'm working on that. But God doesn't. He does not have a short temper. So when we talk about the wrath of God, now when they stayed in there, when they stayed under the blood of that lamb, they were supposed to roast the lamb and, and not boil it, but, you know, and be ready. Hitch up your, your tunic and get ready to go because he was going to bring deliverance. Those who obeyed and came under the blood of the lamb 
were saved. The Lord God is love, but his wrath is very real. It is not a part or separate from his love. The best way I have to describe this for you is like this. If someone was messing with your wife, and I mean messing with your wife, and, God, and fellas, God gave you that testosterone on purpose, okay? If someone was messing with your wife, would you not deal with it? That's love. And that's wrath from a place of love. That's the best I can do to give you an illustration. God is love. And he is always willing that none should perish. And he, the eight billion, and we are to reach out and bring them to Christ. Compel them to Christ. But if people just go, no, no. And they don't even have to do it with a smirky look. They can just be, no. But as long as it's refusing, they are coming out from under the covering that would cover them when the wrath of God does come for the wickedness that is in the earth. He must deal with it or he is not a good God. So we come under the cup. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are yeah, so we come under the covering of the blood of Jesus, and that wrath is not for us. Not because we're just perfect on our own, but because we are covered by the perfect blood of perfect Jesus Christ. So, verse 20 and 21, we see that the Lord's just holy wrath is coming, but there is protection under the blood of Jesus. And... Uh, no, and it's interesting, the last bit of 21, none of this, the sin that's unrepented of, none of it's going to be like hidden and kept under. It's, it's all disclosed. But if you just surrender to Jesus, it's paid for. It's, 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 it's so simple, but it's so hard to surrender our wills, right? Okay. Now, we get on to the next image, which is ch uh, chapter 27, verse 1. This is my favorite one. Um, in that day, ooh, that day, huh? Okay. In that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, that fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. It's our champion. It's our hero. It's Jesus Christ defeating that old serpent, that old dragon, that old Revelation 12. Who is the dragon, the serpent? Who is that? Satan, that deceiver, that deceiver who has been fleeing when we resist. He is supposed to flee, right? Resist him and he must flee. Also, he is a twisted serpent. Ain't he though? Always twisting it, messing it up so that everything gets really confused if he can for people. And notice also, and this is just something I find interesting uh, he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. If you look at Revelation 17 at the bottom of that chapter, it's talking, crazy images, very cool. And he's talking about the waters. And then he goes on to say that the waters are the nations. Well, that kind of works for me because I see that twisted serpent, the, the devil, writhing among the nations and deceiving. That's what he's doing. And so, but how is he dealt? By the champion, by the hero, Jesus Christ. And he, and it's interesting, he uses his great and strong sword. What did God give to us for armor? Think about it. Help me out. Helmet of? Uh-huh. Uh, breastplate of? Mm-hmm. Belt of? Very good. Uh, feet shod with the? Uh-huh. And what you got in your hands? Shield of faith and? He is using the same thing that he tells us to use. I think that's fantastic. His sword of the spirit, the word of God, which we saw in the temptation of Jesus in the New Testament, right? So here he is. He is defeating that Leviathan, that old serpent, that old snake. He stomped his head at the cross, and then Satan and his horde are dealt with, and all unrepentant, unbelieving people are dealt with at the end of time. And the lake of fire, might as well just say it. So it behooves us to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. So with this, I love this imagery of the hero. I love history. I love medieval stuff. I think it's fantastic. I used to participate in medieval reenactments in my 20s. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you a flag in light of this thought. Can you guess uh, what country it's from? Holler out. 
The Scots, it, it, it gets you for that. And I think Switzerland or whatever that one is, it's, re it's flipped. Red background, white cross, or whatever. I know what you're talking about. Anybody else? It's a red cross on a white field. Uh, okay. Geography time with Crystal. I used to be a school teacher. Okay, so out beside Europe, out in the Atlantic Ocean, there's some islands, and they look like a bag of Cheetos that got spilled. And um, the big Cheeto is Britain. The, and then the little ones are like Ireland and all these little things. And um, Britain is made up of England in the bottom, Scotland in the top, Wales is on the side, and then the little Cheeto off to the, uh, to the west, to you that would be that side, is uh, Ireland, right? Well, this is the flag of the southern bit, England, and this is called the Cross of St. George. Does anybody know that story? Oh, yeah. Okay, story time with Crystal. So this is my rendition. This has been around for like 1,100 years, this story, okay? So there was a lady, and she had been captured by a dragon, and he was getting ready to maul and destroy her, and all of a sudden, here comes George, and again, God bless you men. He gave you that testosterone on purpose. Use it for the glory of God. And he sees what's going to happen, and his heart goes for the lady, and he goes, no! And he goes over there, and he slays that old dragon, and he saves the lady. And ladies, he gave us that estrogen on purpose. Let's use it for the glory of God, right? And so her heart responds to him. And so my version of the story, they get married and live happily ever after. But <laughs> this story has been around so long because it's such a universal truth except we'd been playing footsie with the dragon. And we shouldn't have been messing with his gold hoard in the first place. So we got ourselves into that situation where the dragon was getting ready to destroy our lives. And then our champion steps on the scene, and he goes, No! And he lays down his life to save us, and he takes it back up again. And he is our champion. That's why you're sent. That's why I'm sent. Next flag. This is the flag of Scotland that's used when they don't have a king. There is another flag that's used when they used to have a king. It's out there on my table. Go look at it. When you overlay this, uh, it's called the, uh, the St. Andrew's flag. When you overlay this flag on top of the English flag, that's how you get the Union Jack. That's how you get the British flag. They're overlaid. There's a few extra red bars. Someone told me that means Wales, but I can't figure it out because their flag is a dragon, so I don't know. But God is sending me to Scotland. <laughs> when I think of missions, I don't, I don't think of Scotland. I don't think of Europe. But back in 2011, when I took, you can see the photo album on the table, when I took this trip to vacation to Britain, because I thought I'd never get there, so I might as well just go because I want to go. And then afterwards, that same year, later that year, God said, in two years' time, you're going to be a missionary to Scotland. I lost it. Because I knew God called me to missions. If God is speaking to your heart about missions, don't think it's too big and that it can't be done. Well, yeah, it's too big for you. No, duh, it's too big for me. Can you imagine how I feel about what I've got to do? But with God, all things are possible, right? Believer pups unite. So, so sorry, that's not in the sermon. So um, God said, in two years' time, you're going to be a missionary to Scotland. First of all, I didn't think of that location as needing missionaries. They probably sent them over to us when we were wild hooligans, you know, back in the day. And so I just screamed. I'm dramatic. And I said, don't lie to me. Please don't ever say that to God. That's so inappropriate. But it was touching a lot of things I wanted really bad, and I didn't know they were to be put together into one thing. So uh, after it worked out. And I went as a missionary associate to Glasgow, Scotland. That means a helper. That is a great way to start. If the Lord is calling you to missions, no matter what your age, missionary associate, there are missionaries all over the world who just need a helper with the skills that God has put in you on purpose anyway. Just saying. So I went and I just helped out like y'all do here at church in whatever way necessary, cleaning toilets, preaching, going out evangelistically out in the 
Glasgow green, whatever. And uh, how do I describe Glasgow to you? Uh, it's a rough and tumble blue collar, nitty gritty, like um, The kilts, you know about kilts, right? Men of whatever ethnic background you come from, you all look gorgeous in kilts, and I think you all should be wearing them. But <laughs> um, they don't wear that normally. That's just to amaze the tourists or at a wedding or something. But uh, they're, they're just kind of a, like a rough and tumble, you know, gritty kind of drunk or sober. They got a great sense of humor, but they're ready for a scrap. In fact, the best story that I have to kind of give you an idea of what they're like is the church that I served at, I served at for two years. Uh, I, I didn't get to see this happen, but I knew the people involved. I guess a fellow had come out of a tough Glaswegian background. He'd given his heart to the Lord. He was growing in the Lord, and the pastor saw that. So he was raising him up into positions of leadership as he was properly growing. And I guess one day in a Sunday service, somebody came in one of the back doors, the main doors of the church, and was causing a ruckus back in the back. And so pastor naturally turned to the brother, and he said, brother, would you deal with it? Got any guesses? So the brother went back there and gave that fellow a Glaswegian kiss. Wham! He just gave him a headbutt. <laughs> that was Glasgow all over the place. It got real quiet. Problem solved. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Their hearts are like right there. Um, there's a lot of superstitions. They have, they, you don't buy your own calendar. Someone's supposed to buy it for you. So they already believe in the supernatural. So when they get saved, they're like, well, yeah, God is going to move. When they get saved and they are in a Pentecostal setting, I should say. Yeah, God's going to move. And I saw people coming out of rough backgrounds who expected God to talk to them in the service. And the Lord did. Because of that expectation. Everybody was on the same page with that. Well, like, well, yeah. I like that. And, I, and so I served two years there. God sent me away to France for my first term as a full-time missionary. I survived. And then God spoke to me and he said, now I want you to go back to Glasgow and I want you to start a church. I'm a PK. I went to PK retreats. It's hard. It's hard to be in ministry and, and be the leader and just hug their necks and give them cookies or, you know, just spend time with them and just let them know how much you appreciate them. I can say this as the outsider coming through because it's hard. It's not just show up on Sunday, do a sermon, and then ta-ta. It's, it's a lot of work. And so I, I kind of know what I'm getting myself into, sort of, kind of. <laughs> I really don't know what I'm getting myself into. But at the same time, I'm so happy to get back to Glasgow. When I was in Paris for the first few months, and I was really missing Scotland pretty bad in France, I kept hearing bagpipes starting out the beginning of um, um, Scotland the Brave. Da, 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 da. I kept hearing it, and it was messing with my head. I finally figured out what it was. The ambulances in France start da, 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 da. <laughs> so, God speaks to us in many, many ways. Um, but um, he put my heart there, and I didn't realize how much he put my heart there until he took me away for a season, and I realized, and now he's sending me back. It's not that there aren't churches there. There are. But in Europe, in Britain, very small percentage of people are, uh, 3% for Europe are evangelical Christian. Europe is an atheist humanistic, secular, based, really going socialism, really going communism. It's just not the Europe that it was. And there's been so much abuse in history with Christendom that it's a not good topic. I mean, people have been killed in Glasgow over religion. Gangs are aligned up Catholic and Protestant. And this is not only in Scotland. This is other places too. So it's a tough place. So God is sending me by his grace, to start a church, uh, being a single lady, though I do have a believer pup, being a single lady, I can't just say, hey, let's meet at my apartment for church. That ain't going to fly. So please pray that I'll have a location. Please pray that the Lord will bring me a team. And I want to reach out. My heart is, and, and the Lord will do what he wants, but my heart is for the, 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 just the hurting people that people ignore in Glasgow. So there's all kinds of people from all kinds of nations there. So that is, that is the mission. Back to the word, just to finish. Verses 2 through 5. 
in that day, again, in what we've read before, in that day, sing to her. A vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. God is singing over you. Did you see that? Like a lover sings to his beloved. Hey, it's right there. Go look at verse two and notice the text of his song. I did not choose this. You need to go talk to God. A vineyard of red wine. I do not mean drunk. I mean, he is moved by you. It moves him. When we're worshiping like we did today, my heart was moved with love for God. Do you think God is up there going, well, finally, she's worshiping me? No, he is moved by your worship. It's, he's calling it a vineyard of red wine, people. It's rich, and it moves him. He is not just a stoic, aloof God. He is intimately involved in your life, and he loves you. Also notice that he is watering, just like he, Jesus says in the New Testament, he is watering and keeping you every moment. Yeah, we got to be soldiers, and yeah, it hurts, but no one can snatch you out of the hand of God. Now, you can walk away, but no one can snatch you out of the hand of God. And so he's taking care of you. You can trust him. And then for those of us who are a bit harder headed, sometimes we get so mad at God, we come at him, look at it, with a thorny stick. I can't believe you did that, God. I'm so mad. And we just shake our little thorny stick in his face. Really, that's about all we can do. And so he says, I can just burn right through that. But he gives us an or, O-R, or let him take hold of my strength. When I first read that, I was in Glasgow. April 2011, and I was in a coffee shop, and all of a sudden this imagery came to me like, okay, my brother's six foot four, big fella, big strong guy. He has a very physical job. I know I can go up to Frank, put my, uh, my hand around his arm. He would lay his life down for me. He's even said it. He would lay his life down for me, and I know I feel safe when I put my hand around his arm. Will we come to Jesus and take a hold of his strong arm? He loves you, and he has laid down his life for you. He is dependable and trustworthy, and don't let the enemy keep telling you that he's not. That's a normal fight for people, but don't give in. And it says that he may make peace with you, with, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. It's not like peace for you, peace for you, peace for you, but not for you. Peace, no, for you too, for whosoever will. Come to him. Build that relationship with him. And finally, verse 6, the last one. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. But you got to come. And you got to come. Can I show you instead of using words? This is the attitude of the heart you're going to need. Go low. I heard a pastor in a foreign country, I will not say where, say, yeah, I'm not too sure if repentance comes after salvation or before. Hello? Repent and be saved. You got to humble yourself way down. You can't just come in like all that. So come, come the right way. And he should, kind of like Indiana Jones, come humbly or you get your head chopped off. Sorry, that was diverting. Okay, come and he will cause you to take root in his family. And you're going to be like what I consider to be apple trees. You know how apple trees do? Uh, so pretty, pretty white flowers. Oh, it's gorgeous. And then all the flowers go. Pfft. And then it's just those little knobs, those little nubbins everywhere. And then they turn into the big luscious apples. And then someone should be able to reach into your life and go, pick. <gasps> Where'd you get that? That's when we get to do the other W word, witness. It's not terrifying. It's just share Jesus, what he's done in your life and his word. Just share what you've got. You can't share what you don't have. Share what you got. And probably go back to the word and get some more, right? So this is what the Lord's asking us to see. In these six images, where do you find yourself today? Where is Jesus encountering you? Is it the false pregnancy? Is it the Jesus is the resurrection? Is it come under the covering of Jesus' blood because his wrath is coming? Is it Jesus our champion? Is it him singing over us and us taking a hold of his strength and not fighting it? Is it coming and allowing humbly, allowing him to let us take root into his family? Where are you encountering the Holy Spirit today? 
we're going to go into a time of prayer now, and I've got two challenge questions for you in this time of prayer. So if you don't mind blocking out the world, spend this time with God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you are speaking to our hearts. These images that you wrote, Holy Spirit, through your servants for us to hear and to take into ourselves, we receive your word. We don't fight it. And saints, as we're praying, people, as we're praying, whatever of these images are coming up to your mind again, whatever, it, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Let him talk to you. And we're just going to let it be quiet for a moment because the Holy Spirit needs to talk and I need to be quiet. So think about what he's talking to you about. And if you're wrestling about something, that's really probably what you should be paying attention to. My first challenge question is this. If you are in this house today and you are not currently in a real saving relationship with Jesus Christ, and you know it. I don't know if you had one before or not. It's really not the point right now. And you want to come humbly to Christ, repent, and be forgiven and be born again. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you. Would you just simply raise your hand as we're praying in this house? Amen. Anybody else? Okay, let's go before the Lord. Lord, we come before you, and we acknowledge that we are royal messes. And we are so sorry for our rebellion. We humbly ask you to forgive us. And we surrender to your lordship. And we want to be born again into your family and to deliver us from all the, the evil that's been before in our lives. We surrender to you. And we are instantly redeemed by the Lamb of God. So right now, right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that this person would have the courage to confess to you, yes, I am lost, I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me, be my Lord. And instantly, it's not about feelings, it's about fact. You are born again into the kingdom of God. And the angels celebrate. Thank you, Jesus. We celebrate with you the new life today, the new life. And we rejoice I have a second challenge question. In this message that the Holy Spirit has been delivering to our hearts today, there may be something that he is asking you to let go of in your life, or there is something that he is challenging you to start new. And you know it. And you know you need to respond to the Lord about it. I want to pray for you, but I want to make it tougher for you, because whatever it is, that you've got to do, it's going to take courage. And so if you know you need to let go of something in your life, or you know that the Lord is challenging you into something that you have no way of doing, brilliant, I want to pray for you. Would you stand up and come down to the altar where the cross is? And I want to pray for you. It's about courage. Don't let Satan have another victory in your life. Kick Satan in the teeth and give God the glory and stand up. You need to let go of something or you need to start something new. Stand up. Lord, we know that you want to birth new things, new things in our family, new things in our towns. We know that you want to do new things. And we come and we surrender before you. We say, not our will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing that we know for sure is that the gospel is about movement. 
The gospel is this living thing that transforms the dead. It gives life. It gives hope. It can transform communities. I've heard stories in the past of where there was crop failure in certain parts of the world. People in the church began to pray. Farmers began to walk those fields every morning and pray for rain, and rain came. Farmers began to pray that those seeds that they'd planted would have, have double the volume that they should have, and those things happened. I've heard of some islands out in the ocean. They used to have beautiful coral reef, and coral reef became dead. Fish left the area. People began to pray. The villagers came whose lives depended upon the fishing and those things, and they began to pray, and they began to see revival in the, the atmosphere, the environment, in the water. Saw so coral reef come back to life. They saw the fish come back. It wasn't a natural thing. It wasn't some act signed by a governor or a leader. God began to move because he responded to people praying. God will always respond to prayer, but he always wants you to move as well. So the gospel is about movement. It's not about just sending missionaries or reaching your neighbor. It's about living that life every single day, active, active living. We don't want anything to atrophy. Anybody know what that, that term atrophy means when that limb begins to not work anymore? You can't use it. The man with the withered hand literally had an atrophied hand that wouldn't work. Jesus tested it and it was back again. If we're not careful in our spiritual lives, we will walk around with atrophied limbs. We don't want that to happen. That was a great message, by the way, Crystal. A very, very great message. <laughs> Ushers. Ushers, if you'd come at this time, we're going to take up an offering for a missionary. I will do my best as a pastor to go out of my way to take care of our missionaries. Um, I've sat in, in uh, I was a, a, in leadership back in Indiana, and there was a small church that we had gone, my, the pastor Bush and I had gone to to kind of work with. They were having some issues, and I heard I heard the, the, there was a board member of, of that church, and, and I offered, I was a youth pastor, children's pastor, I said, hey, we will come and do a, do a, a, free, minute, a free kids revival for your kids. I remember that board member saying, we don't do anything for kids here, we're not going to either. And I thought, man, didn't have to ask what they did for missions. It was already new. We want, we want to treat our missionaries well, we want to do everything we can. Why? Because it's ministry. And missions becomes an extension of who we are as the church. So thank you for coming all the way from Kansas, sharing your heart today, sharing all, all, all your plans are. And we're going to pray for her in just a minute. But thank you for your willingness to give today. So Lord, bless this offering and use it to get Crystal to the field and to see a church begin and people saved and transformed in Scotland, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the offering, the, off, the offering is going around. And Chris, I'm going to ask if you would just to come and stand here in, in the middle right, in the, and just face the audience. I'm going to ask our, our, our young ladies to come. I'm going to ask our ladies to come as well. If, you, if you're female, just come on up. Gather around, Chris. I want you to lay your hands on her. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to anoint her and to use her. Going by herself to make a difference going by herself to build a church, going by herself to do what God's called her to do. So make sure you pick up that card out there. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for the call of God on every one of our lives. But today, your servant's here, sharing her heart. You've called her to go to, 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 you've called her to, go to Scotland. You've called her to build a church. Lord, thank you that she was raised in a pastor's home. She knows what the tools are. But, Lord, it's a whole different country. And although she's been there, Lord, there's, there's whole new waves of, of, of challenges that she's going to face when she's there. So I pray you provide the team that she's going to need, the leaders that she's going to need. I pray, Lord, the tools that you're going to put in her hands, she will use effectively for your glory. Anoint her preaching, anoint her teaching, anoint her leadership development. And I pray, Lord, in the years to come, there will be a strong church started by her, led by the Spirit of God, that will impact that community there in Glasgow. Let your will be done. Let your will be accomplished through her life. And God, may there be an anointing that literally breaks the atmosphere there, break the hardness, break the sharpness, and transform lives because of her ministry. 
Lord, provide the finances, provide the support, provide the leadership team, provide the people that she's going to need to do all that you've called her to do, Lord. And we know that you are faithful to do that. So thank you for where you brought her from, what you're doing in her life, and where you're taking her right now. And Lord, we will pray for her and with her to see the will of God accomplished in her life in Scotland. We give you glory for her life and for the call and for her willingness to go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, make sure you pick up a card out there, her prayer card, and look at some of the things she has. Um, next Sunday morning, we're going to be finishing the, the, the life of Joseph, chapter 50 of Genesis. Been preaching about uh, Joseph since the end of August of this last year. So, hope you can be a part of that. Wednesday nights, we're still doing a Bible study through the, through the, the, uh, the monumental DVD series. We'll continue that. And hope you can be a part. Remember the blood drive on the 27th. Remember the movie night. Show me the father the 27th that evening. And also February 4th, the ladies are going out to eat on February the 4th in Liberty. So, And hey, uh, all of our guys that are watching the doors during the morning, we're going to have headbutt lessons after church today. I've still got a stack of boards in the back. Practice. Hey, God bless, folks. Have a great rest of the day.